All right. Um, so I did want to start today. I'm just going to. Uh, um, I did want to. Uh, um, I think oop, more people coming. Um, those who are members um, at Macomb Solel Lakeside got a notice yesterday. Judy Biederman um, died yesterday morning. Um, the funeral is Friday at 10 a.m. here at Macomb. Uh, and this is from Chicago Jewish Funerals. Um, beloved wife for 61 years of Edwin Biederman, loving mom, mother of Eric, Susan Biederman, Jill, Jimmy Greenfield, proud grandmother of Evan, Mia, Casey, and Eli, dear sister of Lois, Mark Cohen. She was a proud Northwestern University graduate. Judith was a speech and language pathologist and developed and implemented adult education programs with the Bernard Wenger JCC. Uh, service Friday. And I'm going to put the Jewish funeral link in uh, the chat. And if you um, if you can't make it to Macomb, you can um, you can they'll have where you can sign on um, and see it virtually. And I know Judy would want us to continue studying today. Um. And it's a, you know, up until a couple of weeks ago, she was here studying with us and it was always important to her. So, um, you know, had the funeral been today, that would have been a different story. But um, I think we have to study on and remember her. And uh, she was really a Jewish scholar. She always championed um, adult education, book groups, this book group, um, and certainly um, made it made my job here not only easier, more worthwhile. And I, um, you know, we're thinking about her family and what you say um, when somebody um, Jewish dies and before the funeral is Baruch Dayan HaEmet, um, blessed is God who is the judge. And then oh, Elaine Greenberg's calling. I'm sure she needs the link. I'll just send it to her in a minute. And, and, and then, you know, we, um, at the funeral, we say, may you be comforted with the mourners um, of Zion and Jerusalem. So we're thinking about her whole extended family. And um, I, you know, I'm sure I'll see many of you here on um, Friday. Um, I will be here. So, um, I, you know, I think that's what uh, I can share. That's what I know. Um, she asked for donations to come here. You know, would it be so bad, you know, if they went to adult enrichment? <laughs> but that's up to you. Um, and, um, I, you know, my, my heart has really been full and thinking about her. I, you know, I've been thinking about her for a while. I think um, we know from studying with her, her voice, um, you know, it was very hard for her to talk. And um, so it, it's uh, um, I'm glad that we're all together this morning. And if anyone and wants to say something, yes, Terry. I would just like to add, I'm here because of Judy, as you know, and um, uh, I just want to say, Vanessa, she had so much respect for you, and uh, she just really thought you were amazing, so I just think that would be important for you to know that, that that's what she shared with me. Thank you. <laughs> my, <laughs> as my dad would say, get a hold of yourself. Um, <laughs> Um, Alice, did you want to say something? Yeah, I did. You know, I knew Judy from Solel before we were Macomb Solel Lakeside, but I didn't know her that well. I really felt like I got to know her through our group, through our book group. And I feel like she always gave such insight, insightful remarks. And she always, um, I don't know, I, I think she saw to the root of everything really, really well. And um, I'm going to miss her so much. Oof, Abby, I'm going to unmute you. Go ahead. Vaguely from our previous many years at, at Solel before we left, but I also knew her for many years. Um, my go-to when I could get away from work was Joyce Schrager's current events class. And Judy was always there 
doing registration, et cetera, handling it at the beginning and so forth. So it, there was that connection all through the years, but I really felt more respect and got to know her more through this class. So thank you for that, Vanessa, for giving me that opportunity. Um, Marsha Rosenbaum. Yes, um, I worked with Judy at Bernard Wanger JCC for 11 years and she was like a bright spot because a lot of times that place administratively, people didn't see what the innards of, you know, just like you, how chaotic it was. And I would go into her office and she was like a, a sister, a mentor. And I did a lot of work with the property management. So I would help her set up the lunch and learns. She, cre she created that lunch and learn there with, with Sue Klein, also of blessed memory. And um, a couple of times when it was a special speaker, like the, the, the Black Ethiopian woman who was an ambassador to our Chicago consulate. And it was so interesting. She invited me to attend that. And I did do some of um, Joy Schrager as well, and also Elliot Siegel, the film person. She helped set that up. I mean, she, would, she was just amazing, full of energy, full of just love and caring and commitment. And she also, um, you know, the food, the Jewish food pantry that gave to everybody, she was really um, committed to that. She gave back to the community and the Jewish community, especially, and, and with education. And she was just, she was just a brilliant, beautiful person. I just yeah. wanted to share that because I yes. knew her that. Thank well, you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Judy. Yeah, I, I just wanted to say I've known her since Joyce. And um, and uh, I think like what Evie said that um, we got to know her a little bit better in, in this class. I think she was a, really a gift to this class. And I'm sad. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Lynn Salat, are you in um, contact with Joyce Schrager? Does she know? Wait a minute. Wait, I'm, I'm unmuting you. Go ahead. I don't know, but I can I can text her and ask her if she knows. I would imagine she does know because there is a communications string to her often. And she's very much in touch with who has died. I mean, she used to say that at the beginning of class in the current events class too, and in our short story class. Mm -hmm. I want to say one thing about Judy. I think she was one of the most honest people I know. If you asked her something negative or positive, she would give you her straight answer. And I so appreciated that. We had many uh, talk about book choices and, um, just life itself. She was just a very authentic person. Here, here. Well, <clears throat> um, the story we read this week, um, I can't wait to hear what you all have to say about it. I will start, <laughs> yikes. Um, I will start with um, a little bit about Myla Goldberg. Um, I, this is from her website. It's a peculiar picture. She's a best-selling novelist whose books have been named finalists for the National Book Critics Circle Award, the Carnegie Medal, the Hemingway Foundation, and she lives in. She writes and teaches and lives in um, Brooklyn. Here's some other pictures of her. Um, you know, she and I think you know she was her her biggest. Um, book was The Bee Season. And she was super young when that came out and everybody was talking about her. And there's been some other books and I I don't know if her next one was Jewish, but I'm going to have to, um, I'm going to have to look and try to um, see what else she has done. And <laughs> um, she's, <coughs> excuse me, she's done other short stories. And um, she, um, uh, you know, has been prolific in that way. Let me see if I can find out how old. I don't think she's that she's old. 50. Yeah, which is young, <laughs> super young. 50 getting even, gets younger every day. 
um, and so um, did you like the story? I'll start out with that. Mm. Yeah, come on, uh, Susan Wellick. Well, one of the things that intrigued me about this story is I kept thinking about that case of John Benet Ramsey. Yes. And wondered if that was, you know, an impetus for her to write this story. I, as I was reading through it, I was like, are they going to reveal who the person is? Are they, and I thought about John Benet too, although she was in pageants and she didn't, you know, do good work. Then I was thinking about Shirley Temple. I thought about Shirley Temple. Who, in my age, Shirley Temple was huge. And I, to this day, have a fondness for Shirley Temple. And my mom's favorite story is I was in carpool going to ballet class and um, there's a street in Crystal Lake with all the churches. And one little girl goes, I go to that church. And one little girl goes, well, I go to that church. And I, and of course I couldn't be silent. And I said, well, you know, I go to Shirley Temple. <laughs> and the mother driving carpool called my mom and said, Marion, it's time to take her to Temple. <laughs> she thinks she goes to Shirley Temple. <laughs> so, um, anyway, back to this story. I, I couldn't get a grasp on who are they talking about, Judy? Well, I, I really thought the most fascinating part of the story was the title. I thought that it, to me, it, it was the exemplary uh, commercialism of America. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Here we mm -hmm. are, and it's only $2.50, and you can hand it to me. I mean, uh, so her hero had boiled down to $2.50. Yeah. That is, uh, that is very interesting. And this was written in 2010. And of course, those um, popsicles and those, you know, the face things, you know, having bought some are like three to five dollars. So even the title, we can tell that it was written uh, a little while ago. Um, Lynn Salad, then Merle. Um, I had trouble focusing on who the story was really about. And it was, to me, it wasn't about Little Miss Darling. It was about the narrator. Um, and I found, as I was rereading it, I felt the huge, well, do we know when this was written? 2010. 2010. 2010. This hard clash between reality and fantasy. And here's a single mother trying to survive. And um, looks back on her chance at fame and fortune. And we see the two are foils to each other. Little Miss Darling and what's her name? Ice cream, ice cream, Miss Ice Cream. <laughs> yeah, oh, oh, because she was in the commercial for the, uh, the Jordan, Jordan Dairy, Dairy Girl. Girl. She was right. a Jordan Dairy Girl. Jordan Dairy Girl and how they handle, how they handle fame. Um, and being the center of attention. And now she is a mother um, watching her and the lessons that she has learned about uh, commercialization uh, and all of that. So, I mean, there's a lot, a lot to talk about in this. Um, first time through, I wasn't so sure, but second time looking through it, I think there are lessons to be learned. I really admired the mother's reality check on her own child um, and the lessons that she learned from little miss little darling who was the guy who sang little darling wasn't there a song little darling oh, i'm sure richie little richie not little, little richie yeah little richard little richard, little richard did he sing little little whatever so that was my take on it i i uh uh I thought the clash of the two brought out me many of the themes in the in the story. Yeah, uh, Merle. Uh, I was trying to think of a child, not necessarily a girl, but a child who was a peacemaker, and the only name that I could come up with was Maddie Stepanek, who used to be on the Oprah Winfrey Show. Mm. Oh, a child yeah. with an illness. He was in a wheelchair. 
he died at the age of 14, but he had written poetry, a book called Heart Songs, but he also wrote a book called Just Peace, A Message of Hope. And he was like the little girl. He was all altruistic and never no self-pity and always thinking about others. But I thought what this story really was about was this kind of commercialization that has happened in our country. Even when you're going to a, a museum or the home of someone who's really famous and, and a good person, what you're worried about is the treats, the ice cream, the souvenirs, and all of the people who, who kind of cashed in on living near this home that became a museum for this little girl. And the way she died in a crash, very sad, and how the narrator said, maybe it was a good thing to die young because she wouldn't have to have any regrets like you always have when you become an adult. There are always regrets. So I really thought it was kind of a satire on the commercialization that is attached to these, these museums about famous people. My mind just kept going, you know, um, you can think of so many, Anne Frank, um, and- um, The girl you know, who was shot in the head. Remember the girl who was shot in the head when she was on the bus and she strives for education, women's education in the Arab countries? I don't Malala. remember. Oh, Malala. Oh. Malala. Yes. Malala. 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 But she's still alive. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, and I'm married. thinking about, you know, Anne Frank, um, Little Darling. I mean, they died when they were young, and they're John Benet Ramsey. I mean, there is something about that that um, that catches us. Yet people die. You know, in the South Side of Chicago, you know, are killed and gunned down. And I don't know what to say about that. Um, and uh, <clears throat> other thoughts, and then I'll. I'm Lynn. I had another Danielle. thought about why people are drawn to places like Graceland and mm -hmm. Dolly Land and to all these places where people are famous. And I think people are craving um, attention. I mean, I think that they, they think it rubs off on them when they go and visit these places and they're in, in awe of these. They, Reality needs fantasy. This is, I'm back to this, this thesis. Um, it produces jealousy, but it also produces uh, this awe that we have for celebrity. You see it uh, in People Magazine and all of this, pe reading about stars and things. Why do we do that? Um, because we want to live the life these people have. I think Donald Trump is the reason, that's the reason he's so popular is because he's so wealthy and th these people in rural America- Allegedly oh, wealthy. Oh, allegedly wealthy. <laughs> if I vote for him and I follow him, maybe I can be wealthy too. Um, Absolutely. But these, these um, she was so altruistic. I mean, she was beyond what we would think would be um, for most of these people. and. Look at what they do. They steal the stuff from her house. I mean, this is the ironies in this story are unbelievable. I mean, and, they, and she she stole it. She was obviously a young mother to put away for her son's college oh, fund. Um, yes. Yeah. How much could that be worth? Yes. Um, Alice. Yeah, um, this is continuing a little bit, Lynn, what you first started saying about the contrast between the mother, who's the narrator, and then Little Darling, I, I just saw on TV today, I, I can't remember his first name. Um, it was on um, CBS this morning, the, the uh, he was a little boy, he was 12 years old in the Christmas story. And now they just made, he's very famous. You probably, I don't know. I, I don't know if you, any of you have seen that movie, but apparently it's like one of the most popular Christmas movies out there now. But anyways, he was he was doing the one of these things, you know, he's an adult now, a note to myself, you know, if you could go back and kind of tell your young self, you know, kind of what was in, what's important and what to care about. But that's what I the point I'm making is that he he changed. This is from, the original movie. Yes, yes. 
Who? And he, he, um, and Billingsley. Peter Billingsley. Yes. yes. But anyways, what I was going to say is he, okay, he was a child star. And then he, he was in other movies, but that kind of wasn't his thing. And now he be, has become a director and a producer. But some of these people are stuck in what, you know, and that's kind of like this little girl who died. I mean, she did good things, but she was kind of stuck. People made her, well, she died, so she couldn't grow up, but she was stuck in being this little girl, what she was. You don't know what she would have turned into. Maybe she would have turned into this wonderful philanthropic blah, blah, blah. Or maybe she would have turned into this woman who's like a single mother and, you know, having trouble making ends meet. You, you know, you don't know. So I, I thought that was an interesting contrast between people who are frozen in their childhood. You know, even going what you were saying, Vanessa, about Anne Frank. I mean, who knows what would have been, you know, and people put things on them. You know, that whole thing of that, her house was a museum and everything was so valuable. Well, that's what we put on her. That's not what she was herself. Mm -hmm. um, as a uh, student of the Holocaust, all of the, uh, most of the memoirs that we have re read, Ellie Wiesel, um, Jersey Kaczynski, um, Primo Levi, they're written from the viewpoint of a teenager because the old people didn't survive. So we read all of this literature about the Holocaust from the viewpoint of a teenager. And I don't care what age it was, they were still teenagers. Um, Judy. I think that one of the things that was missing for me was she was so interested in the success of this child, but she didn't study what the parents did to help the child to become that. So that as a mother herself, as she's looking at her child and she's frustrated with how he reacts to her wanting to educate them in some way, educate him in some way. Um, I, I wish she had gone into how did, how did this child get that way? And what could she have done to have? Um, very yeah. interesting. Um, Lynn and then Susan Wellick. Judy, I think she did say which is ironic that they didn't do anything. Mm -hmm. That she, yeah, she didn't say anything. She, would, she did say I that would, they didn't I, do anything. Kept, they didn't do anything. And yeah. boy, if I had had her, what I would have done with her. And that is the beauty of this story of this little girl, I think. She, uh, she the narrator uses the word wonder, I wonder. She said, I, I can't help but wonder, I, uh, but I do wonder. And I think a lot of people just wonder and they don't act. And this little girl was not stuck at all. She went from, from project to project to project, seeing a film about Peru and then going to Peru. I mean, this is something that she wanted to do. It said her parents couldn't object, you know, they couldn't object. So. And later, the, the, the mother said, you know, I didn't want to be one of those mothers who push my child into something when I know he doesn't have any talent, which I thought was a fabulous insight that she I agree gave me from all of this. So I was sort of truthfully confused by the story. I mean, I <laughs> liked the mother sometimes. The other times I didn't like the mother. I mean, I don't know how I would, I'd love to hear how the rest of you felt about this, but I don't know. I was really, sometimes she showed great insight and she was the realist. And other times I thought this is a selfish person, a cynical person. I don't know. I was confused. Um, I also, um, Terry and then Merle. Oh, you forgot oh. me. Oh, so wait, Susan, Terry, <laughs> then Merle. Thank you, Susan. I got to write it uh, down. Sorry, I want, I also was confused, Lynn, uh, because of the, their, the narration kept changing. Mm -hmm. and the viewpoint kept changing. And I too, I wondered a lot about the parents of Little Darling. And I mean, I think we've all seen and known pushy parents. <laughs> and a kid doesn't get like that without a pushy parent. 
Mm. And uh, somebody has to guide a child. So she wanted to go to Peru. Why does the mother have to let her go? Do you know, I, I just don't, um, I don't get it. Um, interesting. I think when we think of these child stars, you know, you don't think about Shirley Temple's parents. You don't think about, you know, Peter Billingsley's parents. Um, but it's a really good point. Terry, and we, we yeah. see we see all the time, even with the ch children's athletics and everything, the way parents push their kids. It's not always what the kid wants. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I have Terry Merle and then Joyce and Sue, maybe Robbins. Terry, well, go ahead. As you're talking about the parents, if you recall, when um, Little Darling was going down Main Street and asking people questions, they were concerned about her and they took her to a doctor oh, right. to find out if there was something, you know, maybe she had ADD or HDTB, <laughs> which I thought was hysterical. ADHD, yes. <laughs> Oh, he has HDTV. All <laughs> oh, right. <laughs> and uh, which, which obviously Milo Goldberg did on purpose because it's very funny. But she, yes. um, she said, had they, uh, you know, had the doctor given her medication, it would have changed her destiny. Right. So, so she does sort of grapple with what the parents were doing or not. I, it doesn't sound like they were pushing her. It sounds like they were worried about her and trying to figure out what was um, motivating her to be this way. And clearly, you know, she ended up just doing her thing um, and, and never went on medication, obviously. And the one other thing that I wanted to just ask you all about, and I didn't find the the place were her parents on the helicopter when she died yes yeah they were. Yes. right yes. And, and, yes. and then there was a question like was this something that that was done intentionally by the government I mean am I making that up or was there sort of a, a little right. implication regarding that yes right so I don't know <laughs> Where Never is know. this in the in the story? No, that, Terry? On page one seventy one. Some want to know if our government had anything to uh, do. With it. Yes, this town had its right. fair share of conspiracy theories regarding the little darling tragedy, which of course made us think about John Benet Ramsey. And while I certainly sympathize, I don't count myself as a subscriber, even though there were few countries um, little darling visited that our government might have preferred her not to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that is interesting. Okay, I have Merle, Joyce, Sue Roberts, and then Beverly. Mm -hmm. We're not Sue Roberts, okay? Um, but Merle, yeah, I I agree with Terry. That was really the the passage I wanted to talk about too. That I thought that the narrator, as a mother, was a good mother. That she agreed that it was best that they never gave her any medication for ADD or ADHD, right. and that for her own son, she had tried to push him into acting, but she saw that it was the wrong thing for him. So she didn't do it. And that she did allow her son to talk back to her. I thought as a mother, she was a very decent person. She also saw that her son sometimes showed his friends her scrapbook about when she was famous as a child and how he was a little bit proud of what she did, even though he was a very rude teenager. He was also 14. Like, like that little boy, Maddie, Maddie Stepanek was 14 when he died. But I, I really thought this story was more about her as a realist comparing the past. The, the like, narrator, the, the little narrator, dairy narrator. girl. She was a realist that it was no longer about becoming a star. It was about becoming a successful person running a concession stand where you sell ice cream. And you make it as creative as possible. Mm -hmm. And her son was a little bit ashamed that she sometimes brought music in. And, but she understood that people, it's like people want bread and circus. That's all that people really want. And so she was willing to do that as a realist to make her life possible for her son so she could send him to college. So I thought as a person, she was not really a bad person. She was just a realist. 
fascinating. Um, Joyce. I liked her. <laughs> I, I, um, I agree with you, Merle. I think she was a realist. She figured out a way to succeed. She knew she didn't, as a child, she knew she didn't have the same talent as little darling. So she quit doing her song and dance act and found another way to make money by doing the modeling. And she succeeded at it for a while. And I gave her a lot of credit. She became an entrepreneur. And going back to the house kind of thing, it was the, and the stealing of the, um, shall we say, artifacts. It was the people in the town that did the stealing. It was not the, once they opened it up and made it into a museum, it was not the people that traipsed through and um, that took the things. It was the people in the town until the mayor put a kibosh on it. And that's when the narrator took the white shoes that um, little darling had worn on the Tonight Show. And I love that story, how she um, sat on Jay Leno's lap. <laughs> and I, I mean, how poignant is it that, unfortunately, that Jay Leno is in the news and became uh, injured just this week with yeah. horrible burns on his face. But one other point that I wanted to make in terms of little darling's parents, they had no idea that she was writing to various um, diplomats or countries or whatever. She was doing this all on her own and then like the um I don't know whether he was the prime minister or whatever of Peru reached out to her and her family to fly them to Peru after the horrible incident and um because she wanted to uh go to Peru and comfort the burn victims. She felt she had something to offer. She, she was a compassionate, um, loving, um, I don't know what other adjectives to use. She was one of these good people that um, had a, uh, she reminded me, and I don't want it, this to sound cliche, of someone like Princess Diana that he had true empathy and um, a goodness of heart that just came through. It wasn't phony. It truly came from her soul. And I don't think she was doing it for fame or fortune or anything else. It just was who she was. Well, that's an interesting, um, there's, a, I think, a lot to talk about there if she's doing it for fame or fortune. Um, Terry had to go. She says, oh, she, she wants the recorded link. Um, Alice, uh, no, I'm sorry. It's going to, it's, 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 it's Beverly, then Alice, then Sue Benjamin. Hi. <laughs> well, Hi. I, I was thinking about two other people. One was, I, I know I'm going to say her name wrong, Greta Thunberg. Oh. She was oh, yes. the one who touted climate change and she was this huge 
uh, notoriety and success and that beautiful young poet who oh, read that Amanda Gorman. poem at the Ob yes. Obama. And, and I, I would put Diana in the same category. And my question, which is a very dark question, is do they have to die? Mm -hmm. Because if they live and they become adults, will they have an impact? Will be, because uh, Greta, I, I never hear about her. I don't hear about the poet anymore. And, uh -huh. and certainly Diana's life, had she lived, was taking a totally different path. And that notoriety that she had as a, a royal probably would not would have ended. And um, so I wonder, and of course the the Jordan little little person, her career ended when the company closed. So that was a, a kind of a, a of an end. So that's the question is, do the young people really can make a big difference? but can adults have the same impact? Great question. Um, I would say about Amanda Gorman, she is still oh, publishing. <laughs> Here's the, you know, the stuff that she's she doing. She just got nominated, uh, um, Vanessa, she just got nominated for um, uh, a Grammy. Yeah, uh, yeah. She's, so she's still in the picture. Um, I, wait a minute, I, I have Alice and then Sue Benjamin. Yeah, you know what, uh, Beverly, that's who I thought it was, Greta Thunberg. That's what I was gonna say. But I was just gonna agree with Vanessa and Judy. I, I think both of them, Greta Thunberg, she still has a lot of impact there. I, I hear about things. She started a whole young person's thing around the whole world. So I think she's still having a big impact as well as, as you, said Amanda Gorman, um, you know, sometimes that flame of the original, you know, stardom does, you know, go down, but I think both of them still are having impacts in our world. Mm -hmm. You know, when Trump makes fun of them that, um, oh. that they've had an impact, I hate to say that, but uh, Sue Benjamin and then Lynn. So I want to respond to Beverly's question. I had another comment, but I'm going to respond to that question. So we talked today about how the ultimate little darling was Shirley Temple, and she was. She literally saved 20th Century Fox from financial ruin, but she got to be a teenager. They fired her because she wasn't drawing people to the pictures anymore. She got married. She got divorced, and she went into politics, and she became chief of protocol at the White House. She was an ambassador to two countries, but I think her greatest contribution was when she got breast cancer, instead of hiding it, she went public. She was one of the first ones who ever had the courage to do this because she wanted to help other women. Mm -hmm. Yes. And she said, if you have a lump or you think there's something wrong, you get to the doctor and don't keep it a secret. And because of that, women started having uh, different kinds of tests by, by droves. I mean, she made such an impact on women's health. So this is this little darling. Everybody loved her. She grows up, she's not so cute anymore and her career's over. But Beverly and everybody else, instead of fading away and dying metaphorically, she really made some of her greatest contributions because she lived to adulthood. <laughs> She um, had, she was diagnosed with breast cancer in 1972. People didn't talk about it then. Right, that's right. Or mastectomies or anything. But, but she did. She had the yes. courage to do that. And she it was, normalized it. Yeah, exactly right. And then the other thing that I wanted to say about the story is I thought it would, had to do with the shallowness of fame. All these people who yeah. love and admire her townspeople, uh, the narrator, they go in and steal from her estate. I mean, that to me tells you about how when, sometimes when we look at people and they're famous, we don't even think of them as normal human beings. Would you go into somebody else's house and steal from the estate, steal, steal the, <laughs> the shoes or the tights? I mean, you wouldn't do that. I mean, that you would see them as just people. 
So anyway, that's all. Okay. Um, Lynn. I think there is a difference between people who do things because it's the right thing to do or because they're driven by their own passion or people who are trying to exploit themselves and sell themselves. And I think this little, in the beginning, this woman um, in her concession, that'll be $2.50, please. That kind of money that you are aiming for, though it's $2.50, is that the thing? Is that what your fame is going to lead to? I mean, do you want to become famous and gather attention because you want the adulation of people and you want your movies to sell, or do you become famous as a result of what you are doing and because you are following your own heart and your own passion? And I believe this uh, little darling is the epitome of a person who is doing things out of the goodness of her own heart. I mean, she does not want attention. She says that specifically. And the emphasis is on how ordinary her house is and or, you know, how everything is ordinary. This is what she, you know, she has potential. She has imagination. She has talent. And she, to me, epitomizes the, the Browning statement, a man's reach should exceed his grasp or what's a heaven for. I mean, she is putting herself out in all kinds of dangerous situations because she honestly wants to help people. The saddest thing for me was when the narrator said, um, in a way, I envy my son Clyde, his pessimism. He's never going to be in a position to be disappointed. Well, the only way you can be disappointed is if you put yourself out there and fail, but you're putting yourself out there and you're testing yourself and you're trying to reach your potential and you're going to fail and you're going to make mistakes, but that's how you grow as a person. So I think this idea of I'm piggybacking on Susan really, um, what is fame? Is it is what is celebrity? I don't know if you even call these people. I don't think these women, these little girl, these kids that you were talking about are out for celebrity. I think they had a passion. They had a, a, a goal that they wanted. They, they had an interest, whether it was in the climate or whether it was saving uh, humanity or the whatever. And that was their chief motivation. It wasn't the $2.50, please. So I think this is a condemnation, yes, on commercialism, but it's also a con condemnation on human nature that, and what they're motivated by to, uh, to do something with their life. Um, okay, I have Joan and then Judy. Well, um, I'm a new member. and Welcome, um, Joan. Thank you just moved here, but I'm gonna go out on a limb a little bit. Um, I was wondering if anyone else saw this as um, kind of a parable about religion. Oh. And I, I got that mainly, there's a sentence at the end, it says the world's children are tired of waiting. Yeah. And then I was thinking, well, little darling could be a sort of, Christ-like figure, um, then the, um, you know, the relics that the church has um, that they save and the, the um, things that the church sold and everything as comparing that kind of to the expectations of an ordinary person, which goes to what everyone said before, um, the fact that she um, did this out of her goodness of her heart, as to my understanding, Christ did, and it was his followers later who kind of built the church many centuries later, mm. the prophets who did things. Um, so, I thought maybe it was a parable about religion and um, can take it from there. 
Very interesting. I mean, Myla is definitely Jewish and practicing Jewish. Um, otherwise, but I don't know. Um, Judy? Uh, I find that, first of all, welcome, Joan. Um, <laughs> next of all, that is really interesting. I have to think about that, but I was yeah. going to comment on, piggyback on what Lynn was saying. To me, that was really the sentence where um, she envied her son's pessimism to mm -hmm. me was one of the most important lines in it. And where yeah. I got to the question about if she was going to be a mother who would question that, um, she wouldn't be the mother of the successful child who only wanted their own ambitious, um, the fulfillment of their dreams. I don't think if you are worried, if you think pessimism is okay, um, I was trying to figure out her mothering. And I that was the line that 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 got me because she how she reacted to her mothering and how she behaved as a child herself really questioned what was the difference in the parenting between the two. So I was left with that. I think this woman is a great writer. I really enjoy reading it, but um it's not an easy read. No. no. Mm -mm. I yeah. had to keep going back over who's the narrator what's happening mm -hmm. and because but she is a good writer because my mind was spinning with who's this supposed to be how's this going to end um is this relating to I kept trying to relate it to my own experiences of whether it's John Benet or Anne Frank or um Shirley Temple uh, and um, and I, she's done a lot. Of, she's done some other short stories. I don't think there's any more in here. Um, but she she is a very, very interesting writer. And, you know, was, you know, she was recognized very early on as a this young writer who's going to do good things. And maybe this is a little bit autobiographical. I mean, she didn't die. <laughs> Thank God. Uh, Joyce. There is no um, religion in this story. No. There no. is no sense of Judaism at no. all. No, 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 there's not. Um, I'm not. A, I, listen, it would be interesting not only to talk to the authors, but to talk to the editors. How did they pick um, this story? She has other short stories. Why did they pick this one? I have no idea. Alice? Yeah, um, I'm going to come in on what Joan said. I, I didn't think of that, but I think it's very interesting. And if you kind of use that and go back and reread the story, I agree. I think there's a, a lot to what you said because it's like, well, I, I can't speak to Christianity because I mean I just know what I picked up over the years but really when you think maybe even the Catholic religion the most you know when you think about it started with this man who was trying to do good in the world and then what did it turn into this massive institution that really you know relics are important and also didn't always do good in the world. So I, I mean, I, I, I agree with you, Joan. I think that is like, well, I agree with what everybody said. It's a, even though it was a very short story, which I was happy about because I forgot, I didn't read it till late. <laughs> really a very layered story, a very complicated story. And I think you could talk about, now that you said it, Joan, religion. What about the narrator? What about we're talking about what happens to this worldwide phenomenon when they're cut down early? So I think there's a lot of, lot of different um, aspects to the story. Um, Elaine, then Lynn, then Merle. Okay, sometimes I think that there are lots of people that are doing good, but we as humanity, glom onto someone and prop them up. Okay, that's number one. So maybe this girl was doing all this and if no one else noticed, she would not have been a little darling. She would have just gone on, on her way. Number two, when you have a couple 
children, you realize that one has this ability and one does not. And I thought the mother was smart enough to know where the, the ability was and not to push the child. In today's world, the parents, all the kids are brilliant and they push them a lot. But I think we sometimes glom onto celebrities and make them into super celebrities. And then they fall apart as they get older because they can't handle being the super celebrity. Yeah. Um, ex excellent, excellent point. Um, Lynn and then Merle. Um, okay. I'm gonna to react to Alice and to Joan. If you extend that um, allegory, um, you can look at the at the betray betrayal uh, part of it as well in terms of her what she wanted. Is that she did not have a um, concrete goal. She had a spirit, almost a spiritual goal, and what people have done is take that altruistic goal and turn it into concreteness and commercialism and exploitation, which she did not want that's emphasized in the story. So you could you could do that. I had not thought about that, but I may reread it to, to see that. Um, and in answer to Elaine, I don't think that she did what she did for any other reason than for herself and the people she was helping. Other celebrities, I think, have a different goal. I mean, they crash because they're, they're depending on their looks and their contacts. And when those fall apart, they just pass into the distance. This child, um, had natural talent and I she wasn't ADHD but I think she was very precocious and her parents <laughs> wondered why she had the need to go and dance in the, down the street I mean she she was a wild child in sense of her talent and her imagination and her you know and she was annoying they, they said people were annoyed by her um and so I don't think she was blown out of proportion. I think people may have done that, but they she had a right to be revered. I mean, for her talents and everything. So yeah. I don't know what why they why the why the author had to kill her off. I I I don't know. In some books that we that I've taught, um, I say, why did he have to die? You know, he had to die. It was part of the story. He had to die. I am not sure. And that's a good question for us to pursue. Somebody mentioned, I forgot who mentioned it. Jay, I think Vanessa, did you? Why did she have to die? Hmm. I mean, no, I, I did. A I mean, that, that's in part the story of the story. Unless yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. Important, it's an important element in the story. Yeah, yeah. I have Merle, Abby, and then um, oh, who just put their hand? Elaine, Abby, no, Merle. <laughs> Um, I think once the celebrity has died, you're left with the question, how does society still connect with this person? Now, in the case of that little boy I mentioned, Matty Stepanek, the Catholic Church in 2012 was examining his life to see if he could go through canonization so that people could actually pray to him as a saint. Mm -hmm. But in the case of most celebrities, what you're left with is their merchandise. Like if you think of Elvis Presley and you get those velvet portraits of him or something, there's mer merchandise. And the thing that this story ends with is the merchandise associated with the little girl. The ending is where she's describing the ice cream. It's a pretty decent likeness considering that it's ice cream. Hold it up to her photo and you'll see that they got the spacing of her eyes right as well as the curve of her smile. Dollar for dollar, it is definitely the most economical option. The popsicle itself is awfully satisfying. And once that's done, you've still got something to take home and remember her by. 
So, Isn't that a commentary on us rather than on the person who is? Yes, disordered? it's a commentary on society. I think yeah. the story was a commentary on society. I now. agree. For yeah. us, it's the almighty, almighty dollar at the end. Right. What, what our society, if we don't have the religion, not everybody's religious. Well, at least they've got the almighty dollar and they can remember her by her merchandise. Right. So I think kind of a brilliant ending that. The little girl is gone and all the wonderful peace, the, her efforts to spread peace in the world, but all the, the society is going to remember because they're so shallow is the merchandise. The merchandise. Yeah. 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 Well, and of course, that's that's pure America. Evie Venny Lane. <laughs> yeah, my head was kind of spinning all over and the, the what kind of popping into my head when it spins at all was ego. And I'm not sure where ego develops in this. And I think as you get older and, and your e ego kind of pops out of your pocket and it's there and so forth. And I see with our kids or our grandchildren, uh, all the little awards that we would put up on the refrigerator. And then you get to a point where you're so dependent on those, those little mementos or those awards, whether it's for sports or whether it's athletics or whatever the heck is for, um, where it's always feeding that ego. And you know when you're cut short, Maybe there are only so many years that you get it. The other thought that I had that I really did like is, I think we've, we've known that um, no matter how many kids we have, each kid has a different parent because, because you've changed and you're different in terms of you the way you react with each kid and so on and so forth. I don't know, I was the only child, so it's hard for me to really say that. <laughs> um, but, um, the other thing that I thought about in terms of the, the things, who was... Was it Steve Jobs whose shoes got sold this week for like two hundred and some thousand dollars at some auction? Um, said, yeah. Mm -hmm. All those gym shoes that you're always kind of tripping over or whatever. I said, you know, save them. I, you know, they might be really worth something. Um, so I think we're so driven with those with those kinds of things. And um, one of the things that we've done in our in our business is we we run trade shows for the tech industry, and what we always strive for was a very level playing field. People couldn't come in with their, they call them the beef, their booth bimbos or whatever it is they have. And um, one in, and our events were always in Rosemont and our, our tagline was Elvis never sang in Rosemont. And sure enough, one exhibitor came in with an Elvis thing. And we had to ask him to leave because it was no longer a level playing field. But um, people are so driven to those Sotskis, um, and I, and I think we all are, you know, we see these little things as, oh, it must mean something to someone, so, you know, let's hang on to them, or, you know, looking through our, our drawers or closets, where did I get this, and who was it, and why do I have it, but the whole thing of, of, of focusing on the ego, and what does it meant, what does it mean, and, you know, when you're younger, I think the refreshing thing about a child is that ego isn't quite as prominent, and they're doing um, I mean, we see this every year, the JUF thing with the 36 under 36, which is wonderful. And I think some of the other organizations too. I mean, every week I think somebody else is, is being honored for something and it's great to see, but then when you stop getting those, does it diminish you know, what was natural and all of a sudden become a striving? So I did enjoy, enjoy this. I just didn't know because I wasn't culturally aware who Little Darling was, ended up looking at, looking up Little Darling. And I found what Lynn found too, that it was a song. And I don't remember who this is. It's a song, yeah. Yeah. A song. But I didn't um, find the person. Yeah, Elaine, and then um, okay. I have to get my flu shot in a Why did Little Darling have to die? Because she was at the top of her game. And then you still remember what, what she did the good and, and if she had gone off and done something bad as she was older that would have diminished her celebrity and it would not have involved the concessions and, and all of that so you remember like Merle was saying this this young boy that had I forget what the illness was but you remember him that way you don't remember the bad things and you don't give them a chance to do the bad things. This is just this perfect little child that did good and then died. 
I mean, what could be more famous? Elvis was got to be a fat man who who was a drug addicted, and 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 was not the gorgeous Elvis. But because he didn't perform that much, we still remember that Elvis was the cute guy on TV. Okay, so that's how you remember people, and you memorialize them. And she. Little Darling had to be memorialized. Okay, wow. Um, Susan, Wellick. Um, well, I also think she had to die uh, because the whole, the, the book is surrounding this place called Birthplace. And it's almost becomes like a Disneyland. Uh, and that can't exist if she's alive. So in order for her, for them to have this museum, she has to be dead. <laughs> I mean, would, would everybody be flocking to Graceland if Elvis had lived? No. Probably not. I don't know. He, he was pretty darn famous. Lynn. So what would have been a, an appropriate memorial for this girl rather than selling ice cream? What, what do you think, what, I think she, what we talked, what Merle and I were talking about, what's the point of the story? Interesting. The point of the story is that people have lost track of what she did yeah. as a human being and yeah. the important things that she was striving for and had no intention to have concession stands in her honor. Right. So, right. I mean, how about, you know, uh, setting up foundations for peaceful uh, mm -hmm. uh, negotiations or whatever. I right. think. I'm I, Joan. I, think she, I think he killed her. I think she killed her off to show what people did. <laughs> the shallowness. It wouldn't have been people. a story had she lived. No, no. no this would have been a boring bad story. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to say is how did she structure when she when you when an author structures a story. They put in certain elements to make their their point. And she killed this character off to show how these people memorialized her. And this is how they memorialized her by Absolutely. selling trinkets. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Joan, what were you gonna say? Well, um, someone had met, going back to my sort of religious kick here, someone had mentioned how when she was going down the street, her parents, you know, had no um, they were upset by it. So this behavior, if you go back to Christ and he went into the temples uh, as a Jew and he upset the established order and he, they tried to throw him out of the temple, whether they did or not, I don't really know. But if you go through it, the, I think that there, the similarities to the, the Christ story um, get more and more. You have um, the parents who, as far as I know, you know, Joseph and Mary never pushed him to do this work. Um, they all die at the end. That's the three in oh, the helicopter crash. Why were there three in the helicopter crash? Oh. They didn't mention that Ooh. before at all. Um, Joan, you've given us so much to think about. And when I as oh, sometimes I come on and I'm like, you know, I'm very sad about Judy. And then like, it was a really short story. What are we going to talk about? But we had plenty to talk about today. Um, I do want to remind everyone that Sunday we're going to be in person. <clears throat> and it's... Um, Dr. Stephen Moffick. This is Rabbi Moffick's father getting together as a family for Thanksgiving, gratefulness and or anxiety. So um, I think it's going to be uh, certainly timely. Great locks and bagels, 10 o'clock start time. And uh, I look forward to seeing everyone. I'm sure I'll see many of you Friday at the funeral. <clears throat> if you need anything, and Elaine and Sue, I'm glad you got on. I know you needed the links. I don't always see email at the end because I'm here, but um, 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 you can call the office and then just tell them to send you the link. 
And, and Vanessa, tell yeah. them, because I had to look too, if you go on any of Vanessa's previous emails to yeah. you, yeah. it's the same link. Yes. Every time she's come on to us. So yes. if you go to Lynn, that- Lynn knows the secrets. She knows all <laughs> the secrets. Yes, it's always the same link. So you can copy it and, and keep it somewhere. Um, it's great seeing everyone. And uh, just, just be well. All right. Sandy, what did you want to say? I just wondered what Judy's age was and what she actually died from. I, I never I, asked her. I yeah, never. I you know what? That's not my uh, story to tell. Yeah, that's oh, do you don't know her age? She yes, of course I know her age. age. Oh, but I don't oh, think, oh. listen, when I die and there's a book group, I don't know that I want everyone saying, wow, she was blah, blah, blah. So you can ask Vanessa, her. I think I'm the know. same age as her. I think I'm the same age. And so, all right. I'm proud of my age. Right. Happy, right. Right. Happy Thanksgiving, everybody. Happy Thanksgiving. Bye. Happy Thanksgiving. Bye. Well handled. <laughs>